اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمدللہ رب العالمین و افضل الصلاة و اتم تسلیم علی سیدنا محمد و علی آلہ و صحبہ اجمعین و ردی اللہ تعالی انساد تابعین و علماء العاملین و ائمت العربت المجتہدین و مقالدہم الی یوم الدین اما بعد Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh everyone. Alhamdulillah, we would like to thank you and welcome you to this week's session of the Black Imams Roundtable. And the topic of our discussion is exploring our creedal understandings. So in other words, this is going to be one of those akira or belief system discussions. I advise you all to uh, share the feed, tag who you need to tag, because this is going to be a lively yet respectable conversation. A lively but respectable and mature conversation. Well, alhamdulillah, uh, you have the usual three suspects, uh, Imam, uh, Ami Muhammad from uh, Masjid Muhammad of Atlantic City, who will be right back in a minute, inshallah. You have Imam Fahim Lee from Kuba School in Islamic Center, right next to me on the screen. Alhamdulillah, AKA the Imam of the Boom Bat. And you have myself, uh, Naeem Abdullah, the Imam of Masjid <coughs> in Pittsburgh. And above me on the screen, you, we have uh, our brother, Sheikh Yahya of Botomori. And next to him on the screen is our brother, Imam Akil Ingram. Alhamdulillah. So, well, alhamdulillah, uh, we are going to be talking about the creed or the belief. And I want to encourage all of us, I want to encourage all of us that many of us may hear things that may trigger us. But as we said in the beginning, we intend to have a mature and respectable or respectful conversation. I want to mention uh, one hadith of the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He is reported to have said, that indeed I have only been sent to perfect good character. And that narration is from Imam Ahmed's Musnad. If you examine that, that hadith and pretend that there were no other hadith uh, spoken, you will come away with the understanding that the only reason that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was sent was to show us how to act, how to behave because he used the word innama. Like, I vote, that's the only thing I came here to do, right? So we should have excellent adab, excellent character. I also want to mention another thing because you may, as we said before, you may hear something that you disagree with. You may hear something that you trigger with, that you're triggered by and I expect, especially our family, our 3453 family, that we are mature enough to respectfully listen and engage with people who may disagree with us. And we, Ahlul Sunnah, make a distinction between a person's belief and his actions and the person themselves. So, in other words, it was asked, and this is taken from Imam al Ghazali. Or Rahimahullah, he was asked, how can, a, uh, how can you uh, like or love a person but hate what they do? And, he's, and he said, he responded by saying, in the same way that a man has a beautiful wife that is rebellious, he loves her from one respect and he dislikes her from another respect. And so I'm saying this by way of analogy that we make a distinction 
between the actions and or belief of a person and the person themselves. So we may disagree with a person's belief. We may disagree with a person's actions, but that doesn't mean that we hate that person. This is extremely important. This, this, this does not mean that we hate that person. So if and when you hear something that you disagree with, don't respond with insults or attacks or any of that mess. And I hope that we are clear on this. Because, you know, if we have to resort to name calling and all of that stuff, that means that we don't really have a firm understanding of what we say we believe in if we have to resort to name calling. So I expect all of us to be on the best of adept as we talk about the issues or some issues with regards to the creed or the belief that may trigger a lot of us. And with that, uh, I'll pass it to the Imam of the boom bat, inshallah. As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. Bismillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulihi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Wa minna tabi'ahum bi ihsani ila yawm ad-deen wa ba'd. We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this opportunity to gather tonight uh, to have this very fruitful and uh, inform, uh, formal discussion and informal discussion. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept it from us and give us a uh, uh, maximum benefit from it. I mean, all right, so uh, let's get to the drill, you know, let's get that cover fee. You know, we request from our people to at least pay $10, inshallah, or contribute. You know, I'm going to say contribute because we say pay. People feel like we're sticking them up for their bread. And we are virtually sticking people up for their bread. <laughs> so, inshallah, we try to cover the cover fee, inshallah. Uh, you know, help us try to reach our goal so we can continue uh, works like this, inshallah. Ta'ala. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to double and multiply your reward. I mean, also, please like and share this on your platforms and uh, so we can... Uh, Get right down to the nitty gritty, inshallah. So you all have seen the introduction. Uh, right now, it's just me. Uh, we have our esteemed Imam, Imam Akil Ingram, inshallah, and Sheikh Yahya Al Baltimore. Uh, I believe they're from the same, like it's the same locale, right? We both in Baltimore, mashallah. Okay. Right, both in the land of Marlo Stanfield. <laughs> <laughs> mashallah, alhamdulillah. So, um, so we'll get right to it. Tonight's topic uh, is talking about some of the uh, credo issues, inshallah. And uh, just for those who might not know, our, our brother our brother Imam, Imam Akil, uh, did a very uh, informative uh, video, which is called The Deep Dive into the Ashuri and Salafi Divide. And um, he went to at length in discussing some of the issues uh, and clarifying some issues of the Ashuri Creed and also Ex explaining some of the different uh, views that we have. And uh, some of the things, alhamdulillah, I mean, I watched it um, uh, for all about um, the last 10 or 15 minutes, I didn't get a chance to finish. So I got up to like the hour and 50 minute mark. So it is almost at the end, alhamdulillah. Uh, so for those who haven't seen it, uh, it might be a good idea to, um, if you get a chance to uh, check it out, inshallah. Um, and I was, I was pleasantly surprised. I was pleasantly surprised because there were some clarifications, uh, at least from the Athery point of view, that um, many of us, we may not be familiar with. And then there were also some things that, you know, some points of contention that we hope to have a very uh, fruitful discussion about where we have these contentions. And, you know, this is the way of al Sunnah, what kept the, the majority of Muslims together throughout the ages is that they were able to have unity and harmony in spite of their differences, you know, and that is the beautiful thing, mashallah. So, um, so I'll get right to it. Uh, so I took some notes. I mean, it was very deep. You know, you you went in, Sheikh, alhamdulillah. And um, so, I don't know if I may, Imam Naim, may I may I go first or? Bismillah. Okay. All right. So, uh, so there was the uh, the video. Um, the first thing that you uh, mentioned, or one of the first things, is that, and then you can correct me if I'm wrong, Imam, uh, mentions uh, the areas of discussion, and I agree with this part here, 
that they are not for the laity, you know, the everyday Muslim. And this is something that we often mention on our platform, that some of these intricate issues of discussion concerning theological matters are not for the everyday people, especially people if they haven't like mastered their far to iron and they haven't mastered any really sciences, then they, they don't need to be discussing this stuff to begin with. Uh, and then of course, if someone reaches a certain level and they're ready to move on, then they should be able to engage in these matters with you know proper teaching and proper education. Uh, so the first thing, um, uh, the theme that I got, let me just say that the theme that I got. So the theme that I got, uh, you mentioned, you referenced a, a number of early scholars from the Hanbali school, and you mentioned about them, uh, uh, some of these with respect to a lost sifat, uh, and about them being upon the Hakika. So in one, in one instance you mentioned, um, let me see, I'll put it here, that it was, uh, Okay, let me get it. Let me get it right. Okay, so it was uh, you mentioned Abu Bakr Al Khalal, which is one of the uh, one of the foremost scholars in the Hanbali school, and that in his book, which is called As Sunnah, and uh, if I'm if, correct me if I'm wrong, there were a number of Hanbali scholars that had the books called Sunnah or Sulu Sunnah, which talks about the issues of creed in the Hanbali school. So in this particular one. Um, you mentioned a, a narration from Abu Bakr al-Khalal, uh, which I found out that he was called the Jami al-Mafab. I think that's one of his names. Is that is that right? Um, he meant, he yeah, mentioned right. a narration from Walid ibn Muslim, and he asked some of the early scholars like Sufyan, Late ibn Sa'id, uh, Malik ibn Anas, uh, about the sifat of Allah. And they said that we take them as they are. All right, and then so then, you mentioned in the in the uh, in the video, and it says that, and I'm assuming, and this is what I got from it that when they say uh, upon the hakika, now I wanted to ask in the Athari school, is there a difference between uh, the Dahiri meaning and the hakiki meaning? Is there a difference? So that was my first question. Excellent. So, um, yes. So, yes, but it's it's it's, it's still it's, it's nuanced. I guess we're going to be having a bit of a of a nuanced discussion. So, the the idea um, the the idea here is that honestly, I believe it goes it will go back, and I, I would love to hear um, the thoughts of all of you on this when it comes to the the Arabic language itself. Is the origin of words uh, hakika or majaz? Okay, uh, is the origin of of a words that there's a reality to those words, um, or is it more so on the on the metaphorical side of things? Um, which one is the origin? Right. While everyone will say with proper evidence, either one can be uh, moved over or indicated by the other. Right. So uh, in in the Ethity school. Um, the, the origin with the Arabic language is hakika, is that it is a real uh, actual thing, right? It's a real actual thing. And, and with that, that it is taken upon its apparent meaning unless there are um, evidences set that would direct us to other than that, that would direct us to it being met metaphorical or directing us to uh, interpreting it as, as something else. Um, I hope that answers what you're asking. Okay, yeah, that, that covers it some. Um, <clears throat> now, there are no, a, another theme that I got from the notes that I took. Hold on. Before you go to the next theme, I would just comment that um, the answer that you gave sounds almost identical to the answer that, say, I would give. Okay, I just want to throw that out there that based on what you said, I don't recognize a difference between you know what I say and what you say. Man, love what you counting. Oh, I mean, I, 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 I believe it's coming though. Huh? <laughs> Probably. Because <laughs> I mean, what I hope to get out of this discussion is to actually find where we disagree and understand the extent of the disagreement and the nature of the disagreement. 
um, because that's going to bring mutual understanding between our parties and will help us to understand one another. I, I, I would like, if, if we could, Imam Fahim, before we ask like questions about his statement, I think we should give him the opportunity uh, to frame why he did what he did and what was his intent. That way is context. So because people might not have heard what he said, so they and they might they not there's a long video. So maybe if he can summarize what was his intent, what was he trying to get at, and then maybe the questions will make more sense. Absolutely. Would you what would you feel about Iman Akhil's? That would be safe. No problem. No problem. Okay. Uh, Bismillah, alhamdulillah. So um, what, what, our, what our brothers are, are referring to, uh, our fellow Mashayikh are, are referring to here is a, a video recording that I did as the, um, the first admission of the library lounge. And it was entitled the deep dive on the Ashidi Salafi divide. And it was a, a longer discourse. Uh, it was about two hours or so. Um, and the purpose of the discussion was really what we're talking about now to identify exactly where um, there is the a, a difference between us and to also um, properly present the the FD creed and its understanding on one individual issue on one individual issue which is how do we understand the qualities of a law and if we state that we understand the qualities of a law of having an actual real meaning to them uh, as opposed to them being interpreted um, does that have a basis with the ancient muslims or not and is this something that began from the time of ibn utaymiyyah rahimahullah forward or did it exist before that so um because of that in this particular uh setting sitting I actually did not mention one quotation from Ibn Atimi at all. And I went as far back um, as I was able to in that sitting from uh, from the time of the some of the companions to the Tabi'een, Atba'a Tabi'een from the successors and into the, the third generation and, and then onward from there. And um, I, I wanted to identify that in us having these discussions because we often talk about these matters that one often these discussions are, are not for for the laity that they're not for the lay populace of, of, of the muslims and having this discussion also assumes that there are certain prerequisites that we've already fulfilled before we enter into it and and furthermore that there are actually current and larger issues of discussion that affect all of us that we should be addressing uh, all of us as as a collective. And if we're going to be addressing these issues, we should definitely should not be neglecting the other issues. Uh, for example, issues of of um, sexual orientation, of, of gender identity. Um, we, we have the Hebrew Israelites that are pounding at us uh, very much so right now. There's the nation of Islam and, and uh, we, we just have atheism right we have people that are just non-believers right that are just people of non-faith today and there are a lot of issues that are theological and spiritual issues that are current that should be addressed that are uh that are not being addressed and and then i would just say from that point um what i highlighted was from the the standpoint of of where i am and i'll say at least in in, in my training that really it comes down to three primary discussions that are a difference between us and in no particular order one is the issue of or which one has precedence over the other is it reason over revelation or revelation over reason number one uh number two making ta'wil of allah sifat um interpreting allah's qualities and, and then number three, an issue of akhbar al-ahad, of singular source transmission narrations. And, and, and the, with these three, how do we understand them? How do we interact with them? I, I believe the majority of the difference between us is going to be centered in, in these three areas. 
And outside of these three areas, um, much of what we believe in practice is going to be very similar. And maybe there's a different terminology um, that, that we may use for it that may differ, but the meaning often will end up being similar. And I centered that talk really uh, on that second point, on, on the matter of making te- wheel of velocity fact, um, interpreting Allah's qualities. And not even from the perspective of, of saying that it's right or wrong to do that, but just representing what the ethity creed actually is uh, on that particular matter and, and looking to show that it does have a basis. So the point of it wasn't even to say that um, anyone else is right or wrong, but just to present what this is. And I, I believe that serves as, as a summary in, in Allah knows best. Okay, alhamdulillah. For first, I want to ask uh, out of all of you here, who all who you all saw the video? You all watched it? Yes, I did. Okay, I, I, I saw it. Okay, now I, I do. I did not see it. <laughs> okay, I did not see. Um, I'm going to. I'm. I, I just got three things that uh, that okay. stuck out to me. That uh, hopefully you can answer these questions. I email my kill. So the first one is that um, you mentioned in there uh, that the Athari Creed, uh, you said the with the Sifat of Allah who's dependent with the Allah, the Athari Creed says that they are from the Muhkamat. All right, so that's one question. So yeah. I would like I'd like to know is this uh is this a relied upon position in the in the in, in the Athari school? Yes, sir. Okay, the second question was, um, you alluded to a number of times about the kefia. There is a kefia uh, with a lossy fat, and we just don't know how they are. And I think this is a major point of contention because the, the Asha'ira, uh, we we basically, we do tafweed that we affirm the meaning, affirm the wording, and what it means that we lead to Allah who subhanahu wa ta'ala and I had to go back and look at my notes. You said something about it, but I had to go through my, my notes. Uh, so this uh, um, issue of, uh, what did I just say just now? I lost my train of thought. Um, okay. Oh yeah, yeah so, and in, uh, in a couple of places you said that there is a kefia. We just don't have the, uh, the, the, the uh, mental capacity to understand what it is, but it is there. And uh, so that was the other question. What is the posi- what is the relied upon position in the uh, the Athari school? And uh, the other one I already asked um, about the uh, I forgot. I'm, I'm losing my mind today. Uh, it's, it's not easy uh, being behaving yeah, yourself. Here. Yeah. With All right. Um, I'm trying to think. I'm okay. I'm looking at these notes. Imam Akil, you when you gotta behave that. yourself on a black round, Imam's round table, this is what happens. <laughs> <laughs> being used to being so nice, so it's very yeah. difficult. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I asked you about the difference between Zahir and Hakika, and of uh, the Mutashabihat uh, Muhkamat versus are they? Is there is that a relied upon position? And you said yes, but uh, I like to know where. Uh, who in the Hanbali or Athari school, Hanbali school uh, says this is the relied upon position that all of those sifat of Allah are muhkamat or do they do they differ between them in different places, contexts and stuff like that. And uh, because in the, in the Ashari school, we say that there is there is no cave for Allah. And um, one more thing, I'm trying to find it here. And so is uh, is Ta'wil totally forbidden in the Athari school? That was my last question. Okay, so so um, sounds like about four four or five of them there. Um, so, <laughs> all right, let, let, let's start with the issue of um, of of kefia, right? Let, let's start with that, and and I, I think it would do us well um, as we're talking about this if we talk about. Um, 
again, as Sheikh Yahya was, was mentioning earlier, what is meant um, by the terms and not just the terms themselves, right? So um, from, from the standpoint of the, of, of the ethnic creed, when it comes to the, the qualities of a law, we would say that we would affirm inequality that Allah has affirmed for himself, either in his book or upon the tongue of his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, likewise, we would negate inequality from Allah that he's negated for himself in his book or upon the tongue of his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and inequality that he's remained silent about, either in his book or upon the tongue of his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that we will also remain silent about. And we would affirm uh, the qualities of Allah without ta'til, without uh, negating the quality itself, and without tetwil, um, without interpreting that that quality, um, also without tashbi, um, and I, I believe this may be a point of discussion too with us, without corporealism, without anthropomorphism, without resembling Allah to the creation, or resembling the creation to Allah, and without kafiya and and without modality um now to, to your to your point about about kafiya about modality that we do not attribute a kafiya to allah we do not attribute a kafiya to allah a modality to allah now here um it is not a negation that there is a kafiya it is a prohibition of us attributing a kafiya to him. And the, uh, the, the understanding behind that, the understanding behind that is when it, when it comes to understanding how something occurs or how something is done from the standpoint of the, the human being and the human intellect, that there are really only three ways to, to get to that end. And, one would be it is something that you have seen or experienced for yourself number two someone uh it, it is similar to something that you have seen or experienced for yourself or number three someone has informed you about it who has either seen it or it's similar to something that they have seen or experienced and when it comes to our lord tabaraka wa ta'ala then um there is no one that has seen these qualities being effectuated so that we can say um, how he does it or how it is done. So we can't do it there. Um, and when it comes to resemblance, if it is similar to something else that we've seen or experienced, well, let's come with the There's nothing like unto his likeness. So we can't resemble him to anything. So we, we, we can't state what the KP is there either. And then when it comes to um, uh, someone else in informing us of that, then there's also no one else that informed us of that. So because this is the only way to come to, from an intellectual standpoint, the kafia of a thing or the modality of a thing, then it's not possible for us to, to do so. So we are prohibited from it. And also our Lord has not informed us of his kafia. And we can only affirm what he has affirmed for himself. Inshallah. Can I, can I just summarize real quick to make sure I understood you correctly? Please, please. We want this to be our formal conversation. So feel free. It's when I mean, I mean, an informal conversation. Like we talk when we offline. Talk the mm -hmm. same way online. So if yeah, that's why I that's why I jumped in to cut you off so I can talk. Because <laughs> I want to make sure I understand. Because it sounded to me like you said, <clears throat> like all of that talk. It sounded like what you said in the end is Allah has a cave, but we don't know it, and there's no way we can know it. I'll submit to that. Then I understood correctly. Can I also interject with that same point? The way I understood it Please. was was that the 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 Bilak Kaif 
is a prohibition of entering in the cave, not a negation. Sort of like like a like a Latinaki, like not not a Latinaki. Am I correct? Correct. Gotcha. Yeah, prohibition, but not a negation. That's all. Right. With the with the Ashuris, we say it's a it's a negation, like like there is no how to prohibit. So so now let me um, now let, let me jump in uh, to a point that Imam Fahim was mentioning earlier, and and I believe is what um, you may be alluding to as well, Imam Naim. So on this particular issue, when you util utilize the term Tefwi, what do you mean by that? And, and is that, that to me? And I'm I'm saying this. Um, uh, well, ye yes, you Imam Naim, I, I believe that what you may have been alluding to, Imam Fahim also he actually mentioned it. But I'm I'm saying this because um, as we discuss this more, I think we can see if it is the case. I think it's a matter of the terms that we're using more than it is the actual concept uh, once mm -hmm. we get a little bit further into it but but we'll see but we'll see when we say tough weed meaning we accept allah's attribute the way it came to us we we affirm we affirm it in in, it, in its wording and basically to put it in common language allah allah meant what what he meant and we don't we don't get we don't get into it while at the same time understanding that whatever it means he is not like his creation as you say basically he shape right so in other words we don't try to put a spin on it and that includes interpreting it in any other language that's pretty similar <laughs> right to, to... there we go that's pretty similar to this point so mm -hmm. Let, I, would, I would add something, though. Please, please. Which is that the one who does tough weed, he recognizes that it has a meaning and Allah knows its meaning and it the meaning, its true meaning befits Allah and its true meaning does not uh, attribute any resemblance between Allah and his creation. We all, we know that. But the, the one next step that Imam Naeem maybe polit for political reasons didn't mention uh, is that uh, what it implies then is that the literal meaning cannot be the intended meaning. Because yeah. most of the, for the sifat that we're talking about at least, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the literal meaning, if you take it literally, it does necessitate a similarity between Allah and the creation. So the people who do tafweed, they're saying we don't accept the literal meaning. But what they're holding back from is saying what it does mean. They're saying it doesn't mean what's literal. However, what it does mean, Allahu Alam. And they they did not used to go into it. And this is what the majority of the Salaf were on. Not saying what it does mean, but simply uh, reciting the ayah and then keeping it moving. I agree. See, that's why you're here. You're more articulate than me. It slipped my mind. It wasn't no political reason. See, you, okay. you're a better articulator. <laughs> we all trying to be nice here today. I told you that, was some, that was some politics right there. Yeah, right? Imam Naeem is not a politician at all. <laughs> but that's true. true. That's why I was a little shocked by what I saw. But now I understand it was just an oversight. A, a genius, yes. A politician, no. <laughs> <laughs> let me let me give you one thing. And as I'm listening, I'm I'm making mental notes, right? So one departure where we and i and and it's a firm disagreement between al ashaira and what you're describing as atharia or athari as you explained it this is a serious departure between the two when we say bila kaif al ashaira likewise al maturidiyah which we call al sunnati wal jamaa for us, that is a negation of the kafiyah and its impermissibility to attribute it to Allah even without the knowledge of it. Do you follow this point? So I'm just so is it clear? Yes. So when one would read from what you said, is we say 
as the ethery, right? And I have another question before we go to that one. That the kafia is not known, but confirmed. Am I right? Is that what you're saying? Affirmed, yes. Not right. known, but affirmed, yes. Not known. So you don't have a negation of a kafia. You have a confirmation, but the knowledge of that kafia is veiled from us, if we can say it one way, right? We don't know it. The Asha'ira will never accept that. They would say the mere affirmation of a kafia to Allah is manfiyun anhu, negated about him, right? So I'm just, we can discuss why, mm -hmm. and I, they had that indication, but I want that to be a clear distinction so that people understand. So then when we discuss it, we know where the differing is at. To, mm -hmm. For us as a, uh, as al Asha'ira, when, when we use the term kafia, that is only for created things, not just human beings, any created thing. And in our terminology, when we say created something that is makhluk, it is everything other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So to attribute kafia is an attribute of the creation in the al-asha'ira, if you understand my point. So I just want to, so this is very clear so that when we discuss, we know exactly what we're saying. It's not, you know, fuzzy. So we know the terminology. As, and if, if, if all of us are on the same page, what I just described, let's just make it that we understand it. It's not the right now we're just clarifying terms. And since it's going to come up sooner or later, I might as well just go ahead and do it now. Uh, the clearest example, or one of the very clear examples of what you're talking about, Imam Amin, is what's narrated from Imam Malik of the man that came and asked him, Ar-Rahmanu ala rash istawa kayfa stiwa'u. Okay, he brought up the issue of kayf. And you know, the in the sahih narrations of this, Imam Malik, there's two sahih narrations of this event. In one of them, Imam Malik said, al-istiwa'u ma'loom wal kayfu anhu marfu'a. He said, the istiwa is well known, meaning it's well known that Allah attributed himself with istiwa. He says, and the kaif anhu marfu'a. He says, kaif does not apply to him. And then he said, this person is an innovator for even bringing it up. For even bringing up the issue of kaif, he's an innovator and, and had him sent out. And in the other Sahih narration of this, the wording is Alistiwa'u Gweru Majhul Wal Kaifu Gweru Ma'kul. And then he says, I don't see you except as an innovator and get out. So in this narration, he's saying the istiwa is not unknown. So obviously we know Allah attributed himself with it. And he said the kaif is rare ma'kul, meaning it's uh like it, it's nonsense. Like to attribute that to Allah is nonsense. Okay, and these two narrations are the Sahih ones. I know that a lot of people who uh, perhaps have training similar to you, Imam Aqil, they like to say a different narration, but that one uh, is not graded as Sahih. Um, and and I, I believe um, those two narrations that you mentioned, actually, I believe those were um, what were mentioned in, in the presentation that I that I did. Okay. And, 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 I, and I think here, and what's going to happen here consistently, I believe that we would make a lot of the same quotations to to prove the point that comes from our training, right? So just as this quotation from Imam Malik ibn Anas, uh, will be utilized with the way that you're presenting it, uh, in the F3 decree, it will be utilized to prove it the other way. So an Ethri would say, well, kafu anhu marfu'a means that he's attributed with a kaf. How do they arrive at that conclusion from that wording? Meaning, meaning relative to the creation being able to do so. Right? So from, from the beginning, right? El istiwa ma'loom. The the istiwa is 
known. The istiwa is known, mm -hmm. meaning that it is something that is known and can be understood by the creation. Um, well, kaif majhul. And not majhul, that's the weak narration. Well, kaif anhu marfu'a. Okay, okay, okay. So even if we stated, well, kaif anhu marfu'a, that the kaif is, is lifted from him, even if we said it, stated it that way, the speech is being directed to the creation and the creation's understanding and usage of Allah's quality spiritually. So it's, it's still going to be understood. And again, I understand exactly what you're saying. I'm saying from the standpoint of the ethic decree, that quotation is quoted time and time over again to prove it the other way. But then what about the end of it where Imam Malik calls the person an innovator for even bringing up the subject? Right. Right. Well, Imam Ubihi Wajib will sell anhu bid'a. Right. Right. Good. So from, from here, we then look at the, the reason as to the reason as to why the question was being asked. Right. Why was that question being asked? Um ala arsha stoa, kafis stoa, right? Rahman ascends about well, we wouldn't say here the, the word ascension, right? I know that saying that word in English would be a point of condition itself. So uh Arahman, he he makes istiwa. How does he make istiwa? Right? How does he do so? So that questioning, that question itself, to try to determine the kafiyah of Allah itself is a bid'ah, is an innovation. And it was being done at a time as in the earlier generations where there wasn't a whole lot of deviance and misunderstanding. The, the, the origin was that the people of knowledge were the majority and the people of ignorance were the minority, right? The, the, the origin was that the people of the Sunnah were the majority and the people who had heterodoxy, that they were the minority. So in this time period, if a person were to present something that was against the mainstream, typically that individual knew exactly what they were doing and they were doing it with purpose. So because of this, this person is taken um, immediately as, okay, well, you're not ignorant of what you're doing. And uh, if you're doing this, you have to be doing this to propagate something that is other than Orthodox Islam. This is innovation. Remove this person from, from the circle of knowledge. So let me ask you a but, question. But I, I say that to say that I, I understand exactly what you're, what, you, what you're asking me, though. Mm -hmm. I'm not misunderstanding what you're saying. So, so if we can just, so maybe uh, uh, we, because we, we're going to have to, this is going to be an opening discussion as we talk. We're going to have to have more discussions because this can't be flushed out in just one session. But I think in this session, the first level I think we should get at is understanding where we agree and understanding where we disagree in this subject, right? And then the next level of that is defining or defining how we go about solving these disagreements, right? But so I'm, 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 I just want to, because sometimes you can get a bunch of information and then people forget the point, right? So I want to stay focused on the point. So from this discussion, what I gathered, we're all intending to clear a law from the creation. Am I right? Both Ashali, those who say, I thought he, that's our intention, right? The way we're going about it can lead to difference of understanding. One of it is this issue of al kafiya modality. Is it something that is affirmed to Allah Ta'ala and his attributes or it is negated? Al-Asha'ira, they say it's negated. Right? In other, in other words, it's not permissible to attribute to Allah modality or al-kafiyah. 
So when we see in the nusus of our ulama, in their text, when we see bilad tekyif or bilad kaif, when we see that Arabic terminology, meaning without a how or without a modality, when we see that for the Asha'ira, that means firm, absolute negation from the Asha'ira side, from the side of Ethery, and I want to ask you about this Ethery concept. It is a negation of knowledge, but an affirmation of modality. Am I correct or am I correct. misunderstanding? No, no, correct so far. Okay, so this is, let's just put that as an area we got to come back and mm -hmm. we got to clarify and work on. And I would just, I would just add because on the, on the opposite end here in, in the Ethity Creed, if the kafia itself becomes negated, then now at that point, we're teetering on negation of the quality itself. So, so the, the, the say it's, it's the, it's the exact inversion of what uh, Imam Naim presented in, in which, in which you're presenting now. As you know, for the Asha'ira, that, that is not even a possibility. And the reason why I say that, because the term kafiyah itself is not related to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the text of the Quran and Sunnah. As something that is affirmed for Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala. That's inference. It's not mentioned in the Quran or the Hadith that Allah has a kafiyah that is unknown or a kafiyah that is negated. Neither position is mentioned in the Quran or the Sunnah. Am I correct? Yes, and. What you mean, yes, and? <laughs> what kind of politics is that? It's during get it black. Or <laughs> of court, which one? We we here. Yeah, we, we're trying to not go there, but I guess at some point, right? No, 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 no. What I mean, listen. And I said that. Yes, yes, yes. We gotta have a real conversation. We already said we're not going to insult each other. So, yeah. but we still can have a real talk and discuss real differences so that we can understand. If we hide from the differences, we'll never really understand. So I don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we're going to be respectful while we're discovering how to work it, right? So that was the, my point. If, if, if we're going to say that Kaif is mentioned, because you said, yes, you're right. And what is the other point you said? I said, yes, and. Yes, and. <laughs> so and is left open. That means you must have a text that mentions from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran or from Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the hadith that mentions Allah has a kaif or negating a kaif. And then you have to bring that text if there no. is an end. Right. No. Even if you don't bring it down, you have to bring it later. No, I understand exactly what, you, exactly what, you, what you're saying there. And I, I want to say what I wanted, what I wanted to get at, and I'm, I'm going to double back here, is when we're going into this um, with the way that we're understanding um, from the side of the Asha'id al like, cave, hey, does from, from your end, does that ultimately go back to Imam Fahim's first question that the origin with the Sifat is that they are mutashabih as opposed to the muhkamat, right? That, that was going to be my, my thought process there. Um, and, but I don't want to move away from what you just said either, right? So we can kind of determine which way we want to go now. I mean, go ahead, Imam Fahim. Um, on that note, I did have another question I took from your notes uh, or took from the video. Uh, you mentioned, you said, uh, now, as Imam Amin mentioned, that we need to be clear about where we agree and where the points of contention are. So we all agree that, you know, that with Allah's attributes that we believe in them, you know, uh, and so on and so forth, right? Um, and and in his notes I took, it says, well, you said that tashbi only occurs when one says, if, for instance, when you use the word yet, if one says a hand similar to this hand or use the uh, attribute of hearing, hearing similar to this hearing, 
So, and, and then if a person doesn't say that specifically, if you don't say how or compare it to something that is not really touch B, mm -hmm. but I will have to ask you here, if in the after decree that all leave these uh, sifat are from the muhkamat, meaning that they only have one clear meaning, then how would, is how would these attributes, do they have that one clear meaning? Because the one clear meaning in that aspect would make them literal. Even if you don't say a hand like this hand or a hearing like this hearing. Yeah, so so um, the, the first thing there is that that statement actually is not my own statement. That is immediately from the jamet of a Timothy in a Timothy statement, uh, quoting those who preceded him, right? So that, that, that that's not from me. Um, but just so that we can answer the question though, uh, because I, I, I believe the challenge here that, um, that the ancients were looking to solve for that preceded us is how do we affirm the qualities of Allah without resembling him to the creation? And I believe that there were different solutions that were derived to solve for this, which has now resulted in uh, the different trainings that, that, that we've had. Um, but I'll, I'll give you an example that comes in the book of Tawheed of Ibn Khuzayma. Uh, again, so I'm not quoting from myself, but quoting from those that preceded us. Um, he, he brings an example of a, a mouse and a mouse having a hand. And he, he mentions there that if we are affirming a hand for a mouse, this doesn't now mean if we affirm the hand of a human being that these two hands are now one in the same hand and they have to resemble one another, right? That's that's the uh, what he mentions there. So if we're saying that there's a meaning to it, um, the and, and we we affirm it for our Lord, that doesn't have to mean that this meaning now resembles the creation. It doesn't have to mean that. But the hand of a mouse has a shape and a volume and is made up of parts. And the hand of a human has a shape and a volume and it's made up of parts. So if you're saying the reality of a mouse hand, if you're looking at the reality of a mouse hand and the reality of a human hand, the only conclusion you can make is that they are similar. Even if they're not identical, they must be similar in certain ways because they're both bodies mm -hmm. made up of parts. So if a person says that Allah, Tabaraka wa Ta'ala, is attributed with a yed, the question is, uh, does someone believe that that yed is something that has shape, form, volume, and is made up of parts? Mm -hmm. Because if that's what they believe, then there is a similarity. Even if they, with their tongue, say, without any similarity to the creation, if what they're affirming is something that is a body with parts, they are necessarily also affirming with it a similarity to the creation. Okay, okay good, good, good. Now, now from, from here, and in, in looking, looking at it this way, the way you presented it, now that becomes an issue that goes back to one of the three issues that I believe is a point of difference. And now it's akal over knuckle or knuckle over akal, right? Which we're gonna have different approaches uh, to that in areas, uh, reason over revelation or revelation over reason. And, and is it a condition that um, my reason must align with revelation in order to accept it or not, right? This, this kind of, it, it's going to end up in that type of a discussion. But now when it comes to our Lord, if he has affirmed a yed for himself and we can then only affirm what he has informed us about himself, then we can't add more to it now to say um, what you're saying, volume or, or body or things of this nature, except that we're using reason to add that thought. So from the standpoint of the ethity creed, we can't use reason at that point over revelation to get to the point to say that it must be similar. Okay, so I get what you're saying, but I think you perhaps misunderstand what I'm saying. 
Okay. Uh, first off, the Esharis and Mataridis put knuckle over Akka. So at that level, there's no disagreement between us. We all consider the knuckle the foundation. The okay. Akka, if anything, is just a tool to help us understand the knuckle. Okay. Uh, meaning the revelation is our foundation. Okay. But in the example we're talking about, we're not even applying alcohol to the revelation here. Okay. We're applying alcohol to that individual person and what that individual person believes. Okay. So we accept the text of the revelation. Allah says he's attributed with a yad. We accept it. We believe it. We affirm it. Okay. But if that person, that individual human being, when he affirms a yad to Allah, the question is, what does he believe he's affirming to it? Because you said that these things are upon the haqiqah, that they have a reality to them. So this person who's affirming a yad to Allah, what is the reality that he, in his heart, is affirming to Allah? So you see, I'm not asking about the text, the revelation. I'm asking about the individual person and what he believes. Because he's saying the word yad has a reality and and basically what does he think that reality is? And all I'm saying is if that person thinks the reality of the hand is that it's something that has volume and parts and so on and so forth, in that case, he is saying there's a similarity between that and the creation. But we are not saying that necessarily the yad of Allah has parts or a shape or anything. In fact, the Asharis and Maturidis agree that the yet of Allah is not a body, that it does not have volume and parts and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I would say. Go ahead, uh, Imam Amin. You, you look like you were well, getting ready to. to go back to your point because, and, and this is what's beautiful about these discussions when we have them civilly, doesn't it feel good? <laughs> like, it, like we can, we're human beings, we know how to talk, right? And that's a good thing. I think that's a big lesson for all of us. But and I'll say this. So the point that you made, and, and Sheikh Yahya, uh, Yahya indicated it. For the Asha'ira, a false uh, insinuation to their creed is that they prefer al-aqal, the intellect, over the transmitted text. And this is false. We should clear this up, right? So we never have this discussion among us. I mean, in our communities, this is a misunderstanding. The Asha'ira, they say that al-aqul shahidun li sihatil naqal, li sihatil naqal that the intellect is an evidence to the validity of the transmitted text. The asl for the asha'ira is a naql. It is the transmitted text, not al-aql. So the idea that we say, you know, the intellect reason over a revelation, never. Reason is a witness to the truthfulness of revelation. And here, take that principle, right? Take that principle, follow the principle. So when we read in the Quran or the Hadith of every attribute of Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala, which is confirmed to him either from the Quran or on the tongue of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then that for us is the foundation. Now, where do where does the intellect come in from revelation that tells us about those attributes and about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his that, his sifat, his af'al, his self, his attributes and his actions, Allah said about them, there is nothing that resembles him, right? So for us, when we talk about resemblance, reason comes in to support the truthfulness of revelation which negates any resemblance. Do you follow? So the reliance is revelation. 
The reliance is not on reason. Reason is supporting and giving an evidence to the soundness of revelation. If you follow, did you follow my point? Follow, follow, and follow your point and, and agree. So it's, it's it's not at the point where there's conformity between the two. Um, the discussion comes into place, and this is a genuine question that I'm not posing. Right. Uh, at, at the point in time that there is conflict between revelation and reason, how do we approach it in that space? For the Asha'ira, go ahead. The revelation does not come with anything that contradicts sound reasoning. We right? will say the same. We will say the same. Right. So there's never a contradiction between reason and revelation because revelation only comes with that which al aql salim the sound mind would accept. We're not talking about someone who's majnoon, right? <laughs> Talk about sound mind. And this is what our scholars said in the science of hadith, one of the reasons to reject the report that it comes with that which contradicts the sound mind, right? That's among the reasons that a narration would be mardud in the science of hadith, which is mentioned in the books of the science of hadith. Among the reasons to not accept the report is this, that it comes with the sound mind would reject. Now notice we said sound mind, right? So, and, and the scholars have a scale for that. So there's never a contradiction between reason and revelation according to the Asha'ira when we're talking about affirmed revelation, that which reached us by some aspect that is qat'i, that is definitive, not dhani, qat'i as an evidence and as wurud, as a transmission. De I mean, it's kind of detailed here, but I think you're following exactly what I'm saying. I'm following you. Right? So for us, that 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 dichotomy doesn't exist, not for the Asha'ira. And I remind everyone that in the Quran, it tells us to use them both. You know, for example, you get ayahs like, inna anzalnahu Qur'anan arabiyan la'allakum Ta'atilun, right? So Allah revealed this Quran uh, so that we might use our minds. Okay, or I is like, وَقَالُوا لَوْ كُنَّا نَسْمَعُوا أَوْ نَعْقِلُوا مَا كُنَّا فِي أَصْحَابِ السَّعِيرِ Right, so, you know, the Quran teaches us that to hear, meaning the text, the naql, or to apply sound reasoning, that these are both pathways to avoid the hellfire. Okay, so it's not that aql has no merit. It's just that the knuckle is the foundation upon which everything is built, and the aql is there, as Imam Amin said, as a witness to the truth of the knuckle. Can I ask a, a simple a, a simple question? You're sounding similar again. Uh, sorry about that, Imam Amin. Go ahead. I want to like back up a little bit. It's, uh, my question is for our brother Imam Akil. Is there a difference between the quote unquote Salafi creed and the quote unquote Athari creed? Are they the same or are there differences? And if there are differences, what are those differences? Technically, no. There's not a difference between them. Um, however, in its current manifestation, <laughs> yes. Okay, so we would say, and and I, I believe that um, that we all would say similar here, that innovation within uh, our faith practice begins emerging toward the end of the time of the Sahaba, and toward the end of the time of the Sahaba when the Tabi'un, the successors are coming into their own, we, we then get these, um, we, we start getting these fringes and offshoots and, and things of, of this type of a nature. So it is at this point that we, we find um, some of the Sahaba and a lot of the Tabi'un beginning to utilize terminologies 
to distinguish the orthodoxy of our faith from heterodoxy, heterodoxy within our faith. And such terms that begin to be utilized, um, a sunnah, ahl sunnah, ahl sunnah wa jama'ah. And as time progresses, we, we see other terms um, that, that are utilized. Um, you, you see the term uh, as salaf or minhaj as salaf uh, being utilized, ahl hadith, ashab al hadith, ahl al athar. Um, so, from a technical standpoint, for us, all these terms are synonyms. All these terms are synonyms utilized to indicate the the orthodoxy of of Islam creedally. Um, now, when it comes to the, there's a difference. Now, I'll try to answer this as, as forward as I can, and I'll, I'll try to be even more succinct. There's a difference between the methodology of the Salaf and a group of people who call themselves Salafis. So even though a group of people who call themselves Salafis today, um, and I'm not saying all of them, but some of them, actually in, 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 in fact are not applying the methodology of the Salaf and, and are not emulating them in areas where we should be in in aqidah, in, in theology and spirituality, in ibadah, in worship, and in akhlaq, in character. So, so because that's not uh, some of these things with some groups who may call themselves Salafis is not a true representation of that, then we have to negate that as being from the methodology of the Salaf, if, if that makes sense. But technically, and in essence, it should be the same thing. I think maybe I should have asked it different. Uh, okay, I, is there a difference? I, apologize. No, I think, <laughs> is there a difference in the creed of the people who call themselves Salafi now and the creed of the people who call themselves Athari now? No, but. <laughs> hey, wait a minute. You a politician. <laughs> You're on a black M Man's round table. You can't get away with that. <laughs> no, but on, on, on the front side, the front side, the answer is no. Imam Akil, we, we got to show love to each other. Right? So we got to have some fun here. We can't let you fly with that. <laughs> Allah your father come. Allah your father come. I mean, I mean, here. I would I would ask this question another. I was going to ask the same question because I like to be clear and straightforward so we can go to the next step in our relationships as a community. And I want everyone while we're talking about this, because this is really probably no one is expecting us to do what we're doing. It's like, whoa, right? Because our position is firm, right? And clear. However, However, we still, as you said, we have a lot of things. We have challenges as a people, as a community, as a Muslim ummah, as a people in the West. I like how you broke that down, especially indigenous people, especially black people. We could go down and down. We have a lot of challenges besides this issue. Like first and foremost, you know, um, our people, are we praying <laughs> the way yeah, that we should be praying? Are we praying our five in a day? You know, we we need to be starting kind of in these areas before we get too far off into the weeds sometimes, you know? But, Go ahead. But what I say, these issues prevent us sometimes, as I mentioned to you before, from external forces, I believe, for even getting to the issues that's really plaguing us. Not that these are not, but this is a total distraction from on the ground issues. I want to ask you a question because... Uh, you have to, and I need you to be as clear as possible. And I know some people are going to get offended, but you don't mean to offend even if they get offended. Get some tough skin, as we say, right? Because we do the same thing. And, and I said it goes both ways. When we talk, when we say, I listen to wal jama'a, we say, as our scholars mentioned, hum al ashaira wal ma turidiya. That's how we define. Men whom ahl sunnati wal jama'a. Who are ahl sunnati wal jama'a? The answer, ahl sunnati wal jama'a, 
هم الأشائرة والما تريدية. And then there's a stop. That stop is really not a complete stop. It's a stop for clarification. Then it continues with details. And whoever agrees with them in creed, even if they don't say Ashari or Maturidi, right? So which would open the door for others who have the correct belief in Islam, even though they don't say I'm Ashari or Maturidi. Do you follow my point? Yes, sir. So that's why we use such terminology, because some people wonder that, right? Now, why do we stop there? That's a why. Because of what I'm getting ready to ask you. In our present context, in our community, we hear Salafi, Wahhabi, Athari, Hambali. All the terms that are used. Sometimes to us, those terms get mixed up and they're all one and the same with different names. If that is not true, can you define Wahhabi, Salafi, Athari, Hanbali? When it comes to creed. When it comes to creed, yes. Good, good addition. Sure, sure. So um, take the easiest one first, the, the term Wahhabi. Um, I do not believe that there is any individual who is who is Ethity or, or 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 Salafi or or Sunni who would attribute the term Wahhabi to themselves. Um, and it is often seen um, from an individual who is striving to be Salafi slash Ethity slash Sunni um, as an affront. And, and as an offense and as a derogatory term to be called that. Um, that that's not something that um, one would accept, let alone define it theologically, right? Um, is, can I ask you ahead. before you go stop? Ahead. I just want to stop you there. That's a modern position. Even the followers of that creed themselves were known as al Wahhabiya, and they called it in their books Da'watu al Wahhabiya. They said that they, they their own books. That's a historic fact. I don't know if you're aware of it. The the Dawa of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab was known as a Da'watu al Wahhabiya. Mansubi Lehi being attributed to him. His own brother. Sheikh Suleiman ibn Abdul Wahhab, in his time, he wrote a book just for Kant, that's his brother, mm -hmm. and his father, and the Hanabila that were in his time. He wrote a book called As Sawaikul Ilahiya Fi Rod Al Wahhabiya. He mentioned Wahhabiya, the Mufti of the Shafi'iya, Ahmed Zaini Dahlan, who lived in his time. He wrote a book entitled Fitnatul Wahhabiya. So the name was known in their time among the people. And they, in their books, mentioned it explicitly. So when is the change coming? In, in, in their, right, in, in, their, their, in, in their description of, of them, but more, more importantly. No, 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 I'm talking about the children of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. In their books, they mentioned Wahhabiya. Good, okay, good. Now, if- That's his that children, who are his kulafa. His successes. I'm just, I'm just sharing with you historically when we talk about it. Historically. And, and, and from, a, from a historical standpoint, um, when that is being utilized, it is often, because we're speaking about, about 200 years ago. We're not speaking that far ago. Right? right? From a historical standpoint, that is being utilized more so as a political term than a theological term. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm stating this um, as a person that in in Kuliyatul Sharia, in, in the faculty of, of Sharia, um, we actually have as a semester the history of the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. They right. like make us study it, right? right. Uh, and and, um, and that, is, that is what it is, <laughs> right? What, what that is is a different discussion, right? That 
you know, we were kind of having earlier that we probably need to have too. Um, but the, the usage there, when it is being identified or, or as an inscription, uh, as an inscription by those subscribers, it's being utilized politically more so than theologically from a historical standpoint because of what was taking place in the Arabian Peninsula at that time um, be between uh, 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 be between the Ottoman Empire, right? Between the Ottoman Empire, uh, between between the Rashids and between the Sharifs that were, you know, present in Mecca, and and making those distinctions that were uh, be between them at the time, right? And those distinctions, just for note, because we got to be historically accurate if we're going to be fair, Go right? Those, even though it's used as a political term, that political context has theological ideas, right or wrong. The disagreement with al Uthmaniyya, the Ottomans, was not just Siasa. It was Akadiyya as well, right or wrong. I mean, theological sure. as well, not just political. It was theological too. Mm -hmm. So the term, even if it's used as a political context, in a political context, it has theological overturns. Would you agree? Submission. Okay, that's all I'm saying. So we just want to be fair here. All right, so we got that. Now, that theology that is connected to that political term, what is the difference from that and Salafi Athari Hambali? Do you follow my point? Sure, sure. So because that has a that has a theological context. I don't want to dismiss that. Because of the term, they used the term, they had certain contexts. How does that context differ from those other three terms of Salafi, Athari, Hanbali? Okay, good. So let's say this, the the the, the, the phraseology, a da'wah to Salafiya, that phraseology itself is newer. We, we don't find that phraseology, a da'wah to Salafiya, too much before the time of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, and we find him popularizing that, right? We find him popularizing that. Um, no, you know, no negation there. Um, Repeat that again, just so we clear. Okay, the phraseology, a da'wah to Salafiya, and uh, I see what you're doing here, and I see why you why you smiling, man, Fahim. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but it's but, like we said, we all love. It's all love. We we love each other. We're talking. <laughs> I'm smiling because I'm happy to be here. <laughs> <laughs> so the, 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 the phraseology, a da'wah to Sadafiya, um, we don't find that phraseology existing uh, or, or being utilized and popularized uh, before the time of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab. Mm -hmm. um, the, the term, um, the term Salafiya, the term Salafiya, um, we don't find that term being used um, frequently with any level of frequency before the medieval period of Islam historically. If we're saying that the earliest time is classical and the, the middle range is medieval, and then after that is contemporary leading to our time now, mm -hmm. in the medieval period of Islam is where we start finding the term Salafiya being used as such, right? Um, you know, you'll find it in the book of of, of a Dhabi, for example, which um, a portion of it you can kind of see above my above my head here, uh, the bottom of it. See uh -huh. right? the right? Dhabi passes in the year 748 after the Hijrah, right? We we find him utilizing right that particular term. But as for the term, you know, salaf or minhaj al salaf, you find that going right pretty much all the all the way back, right? There's a narration of Anas ibn Malik. Um, himself, anhu, right, utilizing right, utilizing that type of a term, um, but from from the standpoint of from the standpoint of aqidah, from the standpoint of aqidah, in its actual meanings, right, in its actual meanings, not what people may want to utilize it or interpret it as in this uh, uh, in this contemporary era. There is no there's no difference between um, the 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 creed of the salaf. And the ethity creed. Wait, 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 wait. One of yeah, the same. You're mixing terms. I don't want to mix terms. Okay, we'll go back. Maybe I miss her. Go back to the terms you use. Salaf and Salafi are two different terms. Okay. We we got to be clear. 
So we talk, we I asked you about four terms, right? Let's let's go one by one. We asked Wahhabi, we clarified that, right? That's done. Good. We said Salafi. So let's go Salafi. Salafi and Salaf are two different terms. They're not the same. Two different terms. One's an adjective, one's a noun. We can't mix them, right? Submission. So, so what's so when we say Salafi as opposed to Wahhabi, what's the difference? A, a Salafi is ascribing one's belief to the earliest of the Muslims. The term Wahhabi, um, from what I would state from my understanding and training, is a term that in its origin is a political term that was being utilized to establish a land and an attempt at its own caliphate that had that had theological implications within it. That's just being academically honest. Okay, okay? being academically honest, those theological uh that theological content of the Wahhabi political uh movement, how is that theological content different from the content of Salafi? which is the theological movement as opposed to Wahhabi, how is the creed different between the two in terms of theology, okay. in terms of Aqidah? When we, is when it we, the same? Okay. When we, when we, when we, we, we can, we can walk through it. I, I know that time is, uh, time is fleeting here, right? We, we got but a whole so. half an hour. If we stop <laughs> on the phone, it's clear. All because right. we, I said it, ain't, we, ain't, we don't have enough time to finish the whole discussion, the, but we can lay some foundations and we can establish them and then build on them later. Okay, here's where, here's where, uh, here is where the differences are going to come. The, the, the theological premises that Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab laid down began to be applied by um, his children, more so his grandchildren mm -hmm. in those generations after, in those students, right? Mm -hmm. In those in those generations, in such a way that uh that effectuated tech fear, that effectuated uh tech fear upon peoples who were Muslims. Okay. Um this isn't something that we see with great frequency. Um, with Muhammad Ibn Abdul Wahhab himself, um, you know, even though there's some areas that we could have a discussion, but uh, once we get into the uh, children, more so the grandchildren, and those generations after, and the students on those levels, uh, it's it's an issue. It's a, it comes down to an issue of applying tech fear to Muslims as a point of of distinction. Right, as a point of distinction between what in this sitting here we're calling Wahhabi and Salafi slash Ethity. So you're saying the difference in creed is Mas'ala to Takfir, the, yep. the question or the issue of Takfir mm -hmm. between Al Wahhabi, the political movement, and Salafi, the theological movement. Yes. I, I'm going to let that pass. We just hold that there, put a pin in it. Ethari. Same. So Ethari and Salafi is the same. Same. Same thing. Same. No difference. No difference. And what it and what it actually is theologically. I'm not saying is the same. I'm not saying contemporarily how people are choosing to utilize it. I'm saying actually. Okay, so I am. I would be correct when I say, and people get mad at me when I say it, Athari and Salafi is the same stuff. You're just changing names. You just said that's true. That is true. People deny it, but that's why I'm asking you. So we we clearing it out because I say it all the time. When somebody say we Athari, I say then Salafi say the same thing, right? You said it's the same thing, and I just when we so we can have points where we agree, right? And, 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 and let me just say. The, the reason why it is the same, and, and maybe maybe uh, some of the people that are saying what you said, I, I I can't imagine, 
I, I can't imagine that they've undergone formal or traditional training. Um, I, I can't imagine that um, because of the fact if you're going to look at uh, Salafia or the Salafi creed from an academic standpoint, then you look at the origin of where these terms are actually coming from. And the vast majority of them are rooted in some form of text as a synonym with the purpose of distinguishing Orthodox Islam from those that began to uh, enter into heterodoxy, the Mu'tazila, the Qadriya, you know, Jahmiya, thus and so, right? That's why it began to be utilized in the first place. They just had different terms that they used to get to the same point, right? Which, which is what I'm saying, which I've, I've always said that, and I agree with you, but just in, for the purpose of discussion, we should establish what we're talking about, Hembali. So we did three. We did Wahhabi, we did Salafi, we did Athari. Hembali, what's the difference? Same. There's the same. Same. Now the Hembalis are getting ready to lose their Kufis, their Thobes, and everything else. Right? <laughs> no, you said that. So the Hembalis, as well as the Salafi and Athari, are the same, and they differ from the Wahhabi in the term of considering Muslims as non-believers. That's the, the distinguishing difference. The rest of it is the same. Am yes. I safe to say that? Yes, I think that, I believe that's safe. So when I say what I say, and I exclude something from your definitions, I am correct in that, whether you agree with that exclusion, I'm saying it's the same thing. And they're using different words to say the same thing which I've been telling people all the time, and I get a lot of flack, especially from the Hanabila. The Hanabila would disagree with you that, and I'm gonna tell you why, right? If we're talking about, you said they're all the same. From the textual books of Al Hanabila, they have the same thing as the Ashaira when saying, uh, when saying that there is no kafia, the true Hanabila in their books they negate kafia. They don't say a kafia is known to Allah. In their books of the Hanabila, especially the latter among them, and let's say from the ninth century, and, and I, I was going to say yeah, more than likely you're, you're going mutawasit or mutaakhar, not exactly, not muqaddam, right. So Not here's what I'm saying. Go ahead. So the Hanabila that we deal with in our time, they're talking about the Hanabila attributed to the early ones, but clarifying it by the Muta'akhirin mm -hmm. of the Hanabila. Mm -hmm. And that is distinctly different from the Athari Salafi Wahhabi Creed. Totally different. It is more similar to the Ashari Creed, which Sheikh Yahya indicated when he said that Allah is not a jism, that Allah is not a body. They don't say, we don't say he's a body or not a body like, like the Salafiyya or the Wahhabiyya or the Athariyya. They say exactly what the Ashari say. How do you explain that? Well, again, again, um, as I was surmising, I, I believe, well, let me go back to what I was originally stating. Um, technically and actually, not necessarily what is being stated contemporarily. Right. Right. Because what it actually is, if we're going to say, if we're going to say the Hanabila, then we're, we're talking about Ahmed ibn Hamel himself, who passed in 241 after the Hijrah, um, not from the medieval period of Islam into the into the ninth century after the Hijrah forward. We're not talking about that. Right. Mm -hmm. We're talking about Ahmed ibn Hamel and his his immediate students themselves and those that come from that that line like Khalal. Um, and, and who uh, Imam Fahim quoted from earlier, right? So if we go back to what it actually is, those level of differences aren't going to be seen at that level. And, and in part, in part, and this is also being academically honest, and I want to say this is the case for uh, for the 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 Ethity Creed and the Eshidi Creed, there were developments that took place as time went on 
and the the theological challenges that existed, let's just take as an example, during the medieval period, either did not did not exist or were not being discussed in the classical period. So because of that, it can leave it open to interpretation and history had for those that are coming after the classical, classical period to then retrofit those beliefs back onto the classical period. <laughs> it, it leaves it open for that. I mean, it's, it, do you understand there's going to be several levels of this, right? I think you can, you, you'll follow what I mean. There's going to be the level of clarification first and understanding. So we understand when we discuss things, we know exactly what we're talking about. Then there's going to be the level after that of clarifying the beliefs and then supporting it by the text, right? So there's no confusion. I know Sheikh Yahya's been over there. We've been running. Let's let him. And it's saying this, and it's saying this, and then I'll, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll stop talking. And I, I'm saying this um, without negating the reality that there are those from the Hanabila, uh, especially from the medieval period forward, who would then attribute themselves to the Ashuri Creed, right? Like Ibn Jozi, for example, Rahimahullah, right? right. No, no denial, no denial with that. Can, can you do quickly? Because sometimes all of us, uh, talking about the audience, when you use these different time periods, could you put them in context of time? Like, you know, uh, so that people, just so they know they have a frame of reference because the words may be too confusing for people. All right. So so when we're talking about the, the classical period, um, theologically and, and even historically, we're, we're going to move until, uh, in, until about, in the range of the the fourth century, uh, in the, the fourth century after the Hijra, some may mm -hmm. cite into the fifth century after the Hijra, four hundreds. Okay, okay? Right. Uh, after that period of time, we're in the medieval period, where we're getting into the five hundred, six hundred, seven hundreds, right? Uh, you know, names that we're gonna uh, know about and talk about, right? Ar Razi, uh, you know, Ibn Taymiyyah, uh, Ibn Salah. All this is in the medieval period, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then this is going to continue until we get around uh, the around the 900s or so, right? Give or take. And then from that point forward, it's going to be contemporary until our time today. Okay, that's just and, so. And this time period is after after the Hijra, uh, right. not Common Era or the Gregorian years. Right. We just that's just so we can have context. So at at the best extension, the classical period is going to be up to the fifth century Hijra if we stretch it. The medieval period is going to be up to the eighth century Hydra if we stretch it, maybe the beginning of the ninth. Well, he said into the 900s. Yeah. So I'm thinking it's 500 year periods. Like the first period was up to 500. That way it includes right. the 400s, right? Second period is from 500 to 1000. That way it includes the 900s. And we now in the contemporary, which is basically from 1000 on. We, we can simplify it that way for our discussion. No problem. All right, but because when we talk about when we go to text and we start talking about scholars, it's very important to understand these times. They're going to be crucial to the discussion. And all the time we say, when we understand Islam, we have to understand it globally, globally and historically. It's very important, right? Uh, so that's good. Uh, Sheikh Yahya, we've been going on uh, myself. Sorry for, but we just. Try, we're talking, so no, no, it's okay. I'm, I'm actually biting my tongue right now because uh, don't hurt yourself. <laughs> <laughs> because, like you said, this is the first stage, right? And in this stage, the goal is to understand one another, you know. And of course, my urge is to ask certain questions uh, that really are, are they belong to the next step, which is for us to actually discuss. I don't want to say like debate, but you know, discuss less with a mind towards understanding the other person and more with a mind towards like, um, you know, presenting various difficulties, right? Um, you know, so, to, for them to work through. And I assume you would present difficulties for us to work through as well, you know, just because in the course of the discussion, that's what's required. I mean, this is what scholars do, you know, they're, they're there to resolve 
difficulties that emerge when you deal in a detailed way with our texts. So basically, I'm, I'm saving what I got to say for round two. Let's schedule <laughs> round two before we finish today, inshallah. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, I, my my biggest, we still have a whole 20 minutes, and usually we go 10 minutes after. So, I mean, we have at least a half an hour if Imam Akil or anybody else among us, and we just ask the audience to give us a chance to flush this stuff out. Our hope we were kind enough to each other, respectful enough to each other, that we didn't push each other away from the discussion. I would hope that we did that at least, right? Or no? We were so rough and we don't even want to talk no more. <laughs> I, I believe we're doing well. May, may Allah bless all of you. And, uh, you know, I, I appreciate you having me and being present on the platform and, uh, you know, being able to, to see and talk with my brothers. I, I appreciate you all. May Allah be pleased with all of you. I mean, so that means we didn't, uh, we did do good behaviors. <laughs> we get like a, a B or A plus or something. Right? <laughs> so, I mean, if y'all had questions from the imams or from Sheikh Yahya or Imam Akil, what we discuss, because I want to, I want to frame where we left off some points of agreement and points of departure so we can build off of them in, in future discussions, if, if there's no other questions. If we have other questions or comments or feel free. And, and I think I've been doing a lot of a lot of talking myself and, you know, I, I would love to hear from from the other imams and shiuk as well. You got some imam Naeem? I got a question for imam Amin. Go ahead. Where we at with the bread? I have no idea. I'm not thinking about no money right now. I'm, I'm, so, I'm not on money. If 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 money is not, let me put the link up. I you so distracted, man. You ain't even run the link, man. Yeah, man. I ain't thinking about no money. <laughs> right, man. We got big. We got bigger fish to fry, right? Like stuff. Uh, but I think uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. 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 Yeah. See, get to talk and forget to pay your bills, right? <laughs> Uh, let me let me get this real quick. I'm sorry. Where are we at? All right, here we go. Okay. All right. Uh, so the link is there. This, if you can't see why we need to continue this work, how important what we're doing collectively we have a lot of work to do. We need your support, right? I mean, and I want to thank Imam Akil. He did this without notice, without preparation, and that to me speaks volumes of his character. MashaAllah. And y'all know me, I don't let people wiggle. And he was, in a way, he said, you know what, Imam, I'm there. And he came through. And for that, you know, may Allah reward you. Because that, that shows that sincerity level, right? Uh, so I, I want to thank you personally and from all of us because some people will listen to us and think we got hard hearts with each other, and we don't. We really care for each other. It may not always sound that way, but we do. We really care about each other. So I thank you for that. So if you, this is why we need your support because we're really trying to help us as a collective. We have our way of going about it, but we're really working at it. And may Allah give us all tofik. So go ahead. That was the bread. And I guess, so y'all know the numbers. Do your part. Okay, go ahead. All right, so we're up to 300 so far. Our goal is only 500. So come on, let's, someone generous soul, go ahead, uh, put the rest of it and we finish with it. And we don't got to spend our time talking about that, right? Okay, go ahead. A question from YouTube uh, uh, from Sharif. 
is, is Sheikh Yahya Orthodox Hanbali. <laughs> Look at him. No, brother, I am a, I'm Shafi'i in Fiqh and I am Maturidi in Aqidah. So I, I have no connection to the Hanbalis, mashallah, other than Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, which unites us all. Okay, I have, I have a question if there's no other question. Um, going back to the video, um, so I, I noticed that there's a theme with the, the Hanabila or the Atheris, uh, that they, uh, in having the same goal, and you know, with Tanzi, you're clearing a law from any resemblance. Uh, but one of the things that is seemingly problematic for us, at least, is when, um, they say that the, 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 they don't believe in anthropomorphism of the Athri Creed. Uh, but when they say, and you made a reference to this, you use um, uh, the book from uh, Imam as Sabuni, Akira to Salaf and Ashab al Hadith. And um, you mentioned that he mentions about, you know, <coughs> uh, we only accept texts as they are, you know. And one of the references you made was to the ayat in ayat um, Surah Saud, um, ayat 75, where Allah says about the shaitan, what prevented you from prostrating when I created Adam from with my, my two hands? Would be Yadaya, right? And on the video it says that, and you you were alluding to, if the, all of these, of, of these attributes of Muhammad, they have one meaning, that that verse, that it has to be understood stood as two hands. And where the problem comes in there is that this can be considered like two hands, like literal hands, if you understand these to be hakika. So I think this is a big point of contention that maybe you can clear up for us, inshallah. Yes, so, so the first thing that, that we should mention is um, you know, Asabuni, uh, rahimahullah, uh, he's passing away a um, little more than a thousand years ago, right? In about a thousand year range, right? So uh, we're not quoting from contemporary scholars um, here. And the um, the point here becomes, and this is being stated because uh, at the time that Asabuni, rahimahullah ta'ala, is, is living, um, of course, by that time, the, uh, the the creed of the Isha'ira in, in the Maturidiyah is pronounced, right, by, by that point in time. So the question becomes, um, if we're going to look at the term yed, and I'm explaining the understanding of it, right? Um, if we're going to look at the term yed and then say that we need to interpret it as quwa uh, or qudra, uh, to interpret it as, um, you know, power or, or ability or, or things of this nature, then really the question that he's posing is how then can you understand bima khalaq to be um in 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 proper context uh does it make sense to now attribute uh two powers or two abilities to allah or is it simply power and ability um as a as as a genre um and from where he is staying in the point that you're referring to um he would then say that this it this doesn't make sense right this doesn't make sense so then if this doesn't make sense then it can't actually mean or okuwa that it can't actually mean ability or power so then we must return back um to the uh to the haqiqa uh, to his meaning upon the haqiqa because of of the principle that the the origin is that the text and the arabic language is understood um, upon its uh, upon its apparent meaning, and and with a a um, I, I use your term I use your term here with the literal meaning, and it is only when we have cause to then go to majaz or go to tetwil that we would do so, and the point that he's making is there's no reason to do that here, so then we must remain upon the origin, that that's kind of his his approach here, in this particular work. And, and and I think one one of the things that's a linguistic discussion, 
And the position you made is the position of the Asha'ira. Because there is an, a reason to depart from the literal meaning. Because if you say that, for example, Yadain or Yed, the dual or the singular, right? For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you use the literal meaning, ala dhahirihi, the, ala dhahirihi, the meaning that is literal, or haqiqatan, when you're talking about yet in terms of al makhluk the created thing, and you use that certain language, that wording for al khaliq there is no reality between the creation and the creator is shared. So the linguistic meaning of a word that's haqiqah for the creation cannot be haqiqah for Allah, which gives us a means to understand it majazi. If you under, from what you just described, that is the position of the asha'ira, and that's why we make ta'wil. And when we say ta'wil, Keep in mind, the Asha'ir are not saying that's the meaning. They're saying that's a possible meaning among numerous meanings for that word in the language which matches what Allah said about himself. If you follow, so it's a process for the Asha'ir. It's not just uh, you know, using majaz for no reason. The same reason you mentioned there is something in the text that tells us this cannot be literal. And if it meant literally, if it meant literal, then therefore that haqiqi meaning, that literal real meaning for a created thing is what Sheikh Yahya described. That thing which has a width, a depth, a depth, a length, a size. That literal meaning does not apply to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala existed before all of those hakiki meanings without those meanings being applied to him language is makhluk language al-lugha is makhluka it's not qadima not azaliya it's created so the the dictates of language is not applied to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so a hakiki meaning for a creative thing cannot be applied to the creator. That's the Asha'ira position, if you understand. Yeah. I know you're not getting ready to tell me language is eternal. <laughs> I know you're not getting ready to say that, right? Well, well, in, in, in that discussion, again, so I, I believe the... Um, I just stopped you before you say something you don't mean to say. No, 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 very, very much so, right? Uh, asma. Kullaha, right? That Allah taught Adam the asma of all things. Um, one of the the understandings of this, and this now now we're getting to a, a linguistic discussion. This is a discussion about the Arabic language at this point, right? Right. Um, I just so, use your definition in the Arabic language, and that is precisely the definition which causes the Ashari's to not take them literal. The same meaning that you're saying linguistic lugatan, that's how we have to understand it. I, I, well, let me say, I, I, that, I, I understand what you're saying and I understand why you're saying it. Okay, good. Because other than that, you would have a qiyas, an analogy between the creator and the creation, and that's not permissible. So, well, well two things there, and, and I see it looks like there are questions coming in. I don't want to, um, okay. I, I don't want to sidetrack us from the audience as well. The audience hasn't had a much time to speak. Um, um, I had a couple of things that I wanted to say to what you just said. Go ahead, um, say it. However, but I don't want to take from the audience either. So the audience is supposed to wait for you, right? They good. <laughs> they just, trust me, they got their popcorn and they're learning a lot mm -hmm. just by our manners with each other. Go yeah. ahead, you go free. All right. So, uh, so, so the the first point that particular verse in Al Baqarah that we mentioned and Allah taught Adam the asma of all things. Um, one of the understandings of this in the exegesis of the verse, 
uh, in the tafsir of the verse. Again, uh, this isn't all, all of them, there are different views here, but one of the understandings of Asma is language itself. And with this understanding that Allah taught Adam all languages, and if we understand it that way, then the origin of language is actually from Allah and not from the creation. And it is something that has come from him in his origin and, and gifting that to Adam and then inspired uh, and then inspires the rest of the creation with it. Right. But everything in creation is from Allah. Right. I was going to say that. So we don't say about the earth that uh, it's not created just because it was created by Allah. No, the, the fact that Allah revealed to Adam the names of all the things, how does that in any way negate that those names are created names? Well, well be, because we, the point that was being made was um, because there's language being used, language is created. And from this point, it can no longer be attributed or utilized relative to our Lord when in fact, language has come from our Lord and he utilizes it in reference to himself, not, not, not the creation. He does what not do use language. He does not attribute language to himself. There's language there. Adam, Asma, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So that is from Allah, al Khalik, and he's teaching Adam, who is mm -hmm. makhluk. Mm -hmm. By what? By makhluk words, by makhluk names. You said al asma kullaha. That means asma, al asma li kulli shay for everything, and everything is created. Not a creator. Okay, good, excellent, excellent. So then that that leads us into the next question. Good, I'm, I'm glad you said that. So leading us into the next question then becomes, um. And this is now, I'm not, I'm not saying this to prove a point as much as I'm looking to understand you all as much as right. you're looking to understand me, right? This discussion, I'm not looking to prove, prove points as much exactly. as I'm looking to understand, really. We 100% so we then, Go ahead. How do we understand the Quran as being the speech of Allah or not being the speech of Allah? It, based, on, based, like, based on the point that you two have just I, said. I'll let Sheikh Yahya answer. We're going to give the same answer, so I'll let him answer so I don't do all the talking. Go ahead, Sheikh Yahya. We're um, <clears throat> going to say the same thing. Probably. I uh, hope so. So it's kind of like this. I will give an example, and I will talk more about this at length on Thursday, inshallah, for those who want to attend the Thursday lesson. But... uh. If I write the letters A-L-L-A-H on a chalkboard, A-L-L-A-H, and then someone walks in, looks at what I wrote on a chalkboard and said, what's that? Someone else might say, Allah, because the, word, the letters I wrote on the board spell Allah. But are those figures that I wrote on the board, is, are those lines actually Allah? They are not, okay? Those, those letters spell a word and the word refers to Allah, okay? It's an expression, an expression that conveys to us a certain meaning, okay? Such that when we see the expression Allah, we understand that we're talking about our creator, even though that word is not our creator. We understand it conveys a meaning. You get what I'm saying? Even al Mushaf Hikaya and Kalamilla. I would say Hikaya. I would say Nani Tabir. I would say Tabir. You could Ibarra and Kalamilla. Ibarra, yeah, I'll, I'll go with that one. Because Hikaya, I haven't heard that word from my sheikh, so I'm, I'm reluctant to use it. Mm -hmm. But the point is the speech of Allah, meaning his attribute. Okay, it is an attribute by which Allah informs and promises and threatens and commands and prohibits. Okay, these meanings can be understood, they can be understood directly. If Allah gives you the power to hear His attribute of speech, you will understand from it what He Allah, what Allah wills for you to understand from it. But these things can also be understood indirectly. 
meaning Allah has the power to create created speech which conveys these meanings. The letters and sounds that we recite when we recite the Quran, these things are created. These sounds are created because each letter has a beginning and an end. We can't say that sounds are eternal when they have beginnings. Okay, therefore the words have beginnings. The languages have beginnings. All of these are created things, but nonetheless, these created things can convey to us the meaning that Allah said with his speech, which is not sounds and letters. Jazakallah khairan. And, I, and, 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 and to your point, and I, I, believe I, I believe I've understood and received what you said. I believe so. And, and I said it this way because I believe um, the, the reason why we're looking at it differently is because of the difference in how we might view the Quran being the speech of Allah. Which then leads us to that discussion about language itself and its source and if it's created or not, and then utilizing that to prove this or that or not, right? I, I believe that's kind of how well, that I think our disagreement. We may disagree on that, as you suspect, but I think our disagreement may be in the definition of terms. Mm. An Achari or a Mataridi would easily say the Quran is uncreated. The Quran is the speech of Allah. We would all say that. Okay. Okay. But a person might also say the Quran is created because the word Quran doesn't always mean the same thing. Sometimes when we say Quran, we're talking about Allah's attribute, which is eternal, and it's not a sound or a letter or a language. And sometimes when we say Quran, we're referring to the revelation that was revealed to Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That revelation is in the Arabic language. It sounds in letters, was spoken by Jibreel, and heard by the Prophet's ears, alayhi salatu wa salam. And so when you say Qur'an, it's like you need to be clear about which of these meanings you're even using. Well, I, I can definitely say, um, and this is, I, I believe this one more so for the audience, um, in the in the Ethity Creed, there is not room to say the Qur'an is created. That, that, room, isn't, that room isn't there. We, we would have to say the Quran is the speech of Allah. It is not created um, from him. It has come into him. It will return. Right? We, we, have, we, we can't say that it's uh, that is created with, with, without from, from our from our end of things um, to say the Quran is created because we view the Quran as the speech of Allah and we view the speech of Allah as a quality of Allah. So then from that point, to say the Quran is created is to attribute an attribute of Allah as being created, which would then be right. This is right. This this is what I'm saying. We're gonna. This is the space. Yeah, that's another discussion. Right. right. You, see, here's what the point is. When we clearly define terms, when we clearly define things, we're going to discover where differences are exist. Mm -hmm and how we navigate those differences. But sometimes we don't even understand terms, right? And then we're projecting on each other, which is not good. You follow what I mean? Like from this discussion, we're going to clarify issues and then you'll be able to, you know, have. So we got to close out. We reached a two hour mark almost. Uh, Still, let me just say another couple yeah. sentences, inshallah. No, we got time. Go ahead. We got to the go. and the Matarides uh, agree that Allah is clear of being attributed with any created attributes. Okay, and I suspect you would agree with that as well. Um, so, hundred percent. Even if a person were to say the Quran is created, there's no room in that to be saying that Allah is attributed with a created attribute. Okay, that like there's no. In the Aqidah of the Asharis and the Matinis, there's no room for that, okay? In fact, the reason why we forbid a person from saying that is because a person might think that. But in our actual Aqidah, there's no room for anyone to believe that Allah is attributed with something created, okay? Which is why I'm saying this distinction goes back to what is meant by the word Qur'an. Because the word Qur'an can refer to Allah's attribute. It can also refer to the revelation. And these are two different things. The revelation is not the same as Allah's attribute. 
but it conveys meanings that Allah said with his attribute. You get, so that's the Ash'ari Maturidi position on that one. Alhamdulillah. Maybe I should have asked you in the beginning, uh, Imam Akil, but there were some questions earlier up. Some people were asking for your training, your education. <laughs> I'm um, I'm your brother. I'm, I'm, I'm your brother. Um, no, no, overly fabulous uh, education <coughs> or anything like that. Um, I would I would just summarize and and say, um, the Islamic University of Medina, uh, beginning uh, in the College of Hadith, but uh, you know matriculating through the College of Sharia, ah, um, you know with emphasis on fiqh and usul fiqh. Um, and, and also having spent time studying with scholars uh, primarily either from or were present in um, Mecca, Medina, Egypt, and Kuwait. Alhamdulillah, shukran. And Sheikh Yahya, uh, our brother uh, Ahmed Ibn Batuta, he asked you, he said, why not Ashari? You know, because usually you know, Shafi, Maliki, go with Ashari. Usually, when you hear Anafi, then you hear you think Maturidi. So, I, I think uh, that spiked a lot of people's curiosity. That is true. Uh, so, first off, honestly, I think the distinction between Ashari and Maturidi uh, is not even a significant distinction. These two medhabs are at like 99% in agreement. So, it almost doesn't matter if you call someone Ashari or Maturidi. Uh, but the reason why I identify as Maturidi is because the texts of Aqidah, which I studied, are texts which are more closely associated with the Maturidi tradition, such as Al-Aqidah Al-Tahawiyah, Al-Aqidah Nasafiya, Al-Fiqh Al-Akbar. Um, these are the texts that I studied in Aqidah and others like it. Um, I did study a couple texts that are associated with the Ash'ari um, tradition as well. But I'm I'm more firmly rooted in the Maturidi tradition, so that's what I identify as. But as I said, there's hardly any difference between them. Alhamdulillah, I did put some more questions in the private chat. I don't know how much longer Imam Amin wants to go. At max ten minutes, because it's almost is my grip close to my grip here, so I got at least at max ten minutes. Okay. This question, I believe, is for uh, Imam Akil. It's from Sidi Nasser. It says, do the Athari affirm the concept of Trinitarian three types of Tawheed, Tawheed al-Rububiyya, Tawheed al-Uluhiyya, and Tawheed al aswan wa sifat mentioned in the text of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab and the, and the modern Salafi text? The, the answer to that is, um, in concept, yes, regardless if that specific categorization is, is utilized or, or not. Um, for example, um, a little bit earlier on, you, you might find um, you, you might find terminologies like um, a tolerable cost, um, tawheed of tolerable cost, right? Tawheed al ma'rifa wa ifbat. Right, as opposed to what you're inferring to, uh, referring to here, which I would posit will be a uluhi as well as he fat. Um, but the meanings of them uh, would, would be the same. And um, in, in, in origin, uh, believe it or not, um, these different categorizations um, in their earliest manifestations are actually being sourced back to a statement of, of Abu Hanifa, uh, Rahimahullah. I'm looking for more questions. Hold on. There's one from Muawiyah. Said, I have a question. Insofar as the modern Salafi movement is an outgrowth of the modern of the movement of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, please explain how Muslims can trust and take knowledge from individuals who come from a movement that was built upon the takfir and killing of fellow Muslims. 
And this sentiment is echoed today among modern Salafi scholars, especially in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, who routinely takfir, accuse of shirk, those ulama Muslims who disagree with their movement. And, and, and that one is uh, it's directed to me, of course, you said, right? Or, or is that I'm, open? I'm assuming so. Yeah, that, that's for you. That's your boy. Right? Yeah. <laughs> You're the only one representing everyone here, so it's definitely <laughs> to you, mashallah. <laughs> well, um, a, a, again, again, just by the just by the structure of the, of the question, we see the political implications that are in it, right? Um, because really, that's where that's sourced more than anything else. Uh, even if they are theological implications that are, that are there, um, I, I would simply I would simply say that we are striving to refer back to what the earliest Muslims believed and practiced as Orthodox Islam. Um, it's not about getting hung up on um, individuals or personalities, or in this case individual scholars. Um, I, I believe that everyone here, um, audience uh, audience included, is striving to get back to as close as possible and as accurate as possible to what the earliest generations of the Muslims believed in practice as Orthodox Islam. So I would just say um, to refer back to that. Now, um, what, what, I, what I would say just from the standpoint of, of, of education and, and curriculum, um, just so that we can understand this, the, 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 the way that this creed is taught, it's not like you study the books of Muhammad and Abdul Ahab and stop and this is it and this is all creed. Um, and there's nothing other than this. That's not kind of, that's, that's not how it's structured. Um, the, the way the structure is, from an, from an entry level standpoint, from an entry level standpoint, um, you may find uh, some of the works of Muhammad Ibn Abdul Wahab being studied, particularly and primarily as it relates to Tawheed al Ibadah, or if you like Tawheed al Uluhiyah, or if you like Tawheed al Ilahiyah, right? The Tawheed of worship or divinity or servitude. Um, and, and then from, from there, you may find a jump backward. Uh, in time from what we call the contemporary period, right, closer to our time, back to the to the medieval period. And, and this is where um, you'll see the works of Ibn Taymiyyah, Rahim al Ta'ala, uh, be, being studied that you would have heard of, like Wasatiya, like Hamawiya, uh, like Tadmuriya, um, works of this nature, and, and then Tahawiya, right, and then Tahawiya. Um, and then from here, once these works have been studied this way, moving backward, um, with 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 qualified uh, disciples of knowledge and scholars, then the understanding is now the person is qualified to enter into the books of the Salaf themselves and understand the context of what they're uh, presenting in the earliest works of Aqida, uh, some of which um, you know Imam Fahim made mention of earlier, um, like for example, a Sharia of Al Ajuri. Uh, uh, such as the Sunnah of Al Khalal, like he mentioned earlier, Husul Sunnah of Ahmed ibn Hanbal, um, you know, thus and so, the, these earlier works. But it, it kind of works um, backwards this way. But the goal is to get as far back as possible, not stop at any one time. And uh, I hope that helps. Let me ask you a question. And no, this is, we, we don't have time for it. Next time. <laughs> We don't have time for that question. It's too much. I, and and if, if we can sum up, because you know we're, we're, we're Maghrib time and we're past our time and we don't want to overextend for ourselves, but I hope this wouldn't be our last conversation. And I hope it won't be long gaps. If you are available, you're welcome next week to finish, if you are available. Jazakumullah khaira. I, I appreciate the invitation. We'll, we'll, we'll look to it, inshallah. Okay, inshallah. Sheikh Yahya as well, so we can have part two if, you know, if everyone's available. Or another night when others are available, the nights are open, we can, we can arrange, especially now. So if another night particularly would be better suited, 
uh, we can arrange, inshallah. I'll make time, inshallah, if, if whenever we arrange part two. Okay. I got a question. Which one of y'all live on the west side, man? <laughs> so, so I am actually born and raised in West Baltimore. Uh, Imam Akil, he's a transplant, man. <laughs> <laughs> he came in. Wait, wait, ain't, ain't you from Atlantic City? Didn't you used to know Imam Amin or something like that? About 15 years ago in a different lifetime, I was an Imam in Atlantic City. That's true. Um, I'm actually Allah. from a little bit further north. I'm from Jersey. I'm from Jersey, but a little bit further north, um, the uh, Asbury Park area, Asbury Park Neptune. Uh, people that are from Jersey, they, you know, they, they know those areas. Oh, you're a beach dude. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> but in the in the interest of, of full disclosure, I I now live on the east side. It, it, it hurts my heart. Uh, every day when I wake up, I'm pained to be on the east side of Baltimore now. But I had my reasons, mashallah. I'd be in pain, too. if I, You know, if I live inside of town and let Marlo run all over them like that. <laughs> Marlo was West Side. That's where I'm from. Shoot. Yeah, but he killed Prop Joe, though, man. <laughs> hey, people kill people in Baltimore. That's just a fact of life. You know, we we, we try to change that bit by bit, inshallah. May Allah give y'all success, inshallah. I mean, I mean. So, inshallah, we'll, we'll close out. Uh, whoever would like to close out, please close out, inshallah. Sheikh Yahya, I will give you the floor. You've been quiet. Close this out, inshallah. I was just talking a minute ago. Not enough. <laughs> so, Bismillah. Alhamdulillah, <clears throat> Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi tayyibin wa O oh Allah, ya hayu, ya qayyum. I ask that you bless us. O oh Allah, I ask that you teach us what we don't know and remind us of what we've forgotten and benefit us by what you've taught us and increase us in knowledge, ya Allah. Allah, ya hayu, ya qayyum, ya arhamar rahameen. I ask that you grant us understanding, increase us in patience, increase us in humility, Increase us in wisdom, ya Allah, and increase us in guidance and help us to guide others. O oh Allah, I ask that you cause this session to be fruitful to those who witness it and to those who watch it thereafter. I ask that you help us in the following days and weeks and months to continue in this path, to help breed and foster more understanding between the different communities, more understanding between the leaders of the communities, and help us to find a path out of this to actual solidarity. Oh Allah, I ask that you cleanse our hearts, strip of our hearts love of the dunya, grant us sincere intentions, help us to be worshipers with, by the meaning of the word, Ya Allah. Help us to worship you in the way that you deserve, even though that's not even possible for the human being. Help us to be closer to perfection. Help us, Ya yeah, Allah, to get to the point where we worship you as if we see you. And although we don't see you, that we at least are mindful that you see us. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Ameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.